This is Alan Kay, everyone. So welcome, Alan. Thank you. Um, I am delighted and terrified to be sat here talking to Alan. Um, and as you've heard, we've been talking about it during the day. Alan has, has seen it and done it. Uh, much of his work at Xerox Park um, has literally touched every single one of us, um, you know, through the technology that we have in our pockets and we use in our homes. Before the event, Alan shared some of his experience and some of his thinking in a pre-read. Uh, and the purpose of that pre-read was so that we could really get into the content with the next 25 minutes. So for those of you who haven't read the pre-read, you should all be feeling Let's extremely guilty at the moment. No, don't make them feel bad, but just to help the next few minutes, how many people actually did read this? Oh, well done, okay. Yeah. Okay, the rest of you need to stay after class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what we're here to talk about uh, uh, with Alan is what it will really take to scale up the circular economy. And I can quite honestly say I have no idea where this conversation's going to go. It will be a ride. Alan has props. Anything could happen in the next 25 minutes. <laughs> Please do tweet in questions using the hashtag Summit2019. We will be capturing them uh, and chucking them to Alan. Um, to get us started, I'm going to ask you the, the kind of most obvious question in a way, which is about Xerox Park. Well, I have to have to start by uh, eeling away from that for a second, but just to get everybody to take a look, I thought about building a little, bringing a little fake fire here because we we're actually doing what human beings did about 150,000 years ago, which is gathering around a campfire. Uh, listening to stories. And if you think about it, our civilization is actually based on writing. And it was based on science. It's based on a whole bunch of things that have almost nothing to do with stories and have almost nothing to do with oral discourse. So it is very, very difficult, I think, to do other than make gestures at immense complex problems that we have. It's very hard to talk about them without being able to even play with simulations of them. I feel like you're making them more guilty about not reading the pre-read. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I view this as a commercial, not for reading my piece, but I did write it, take the trouble to write it just for this session, but that piece was in lieu of giving a talk which would give you the context but not allow for discussion. So I th and what I like to do when I teach classes in university is I write what I think the st students should read and then we use the class to find out what, what they're thinking about and what they know and what they don't know. And I like to do that here. So I think the, uh, a couple of keys here are the, there's a lot of method in the world and a lot of the way the world is, is the result of methods that are still fairly common sense, thinking in the small, everybody being industrious in the small, and the problem is that the communication systems of every kind, including physical, have uh, clogged up almost every finite resource that we have. And so one quotation I'd like you to take away with you was done by Einstein some years ago, and he said, we cannot solve our problems with the same levels and kinds of thinking we use to create them. This is the number one thing I'd like you to take away. Alan, can I ask, so yes. how, does, how does that then translate to what Andrew was saying, and this, uh, what we've been talking about today, needing to kind of scale up our yes, response? Well, so when I hear people saying we, we have to get away from linear, that worries me just because there's no known linear, real linear relationship uh, in the universe, even the ones that we treat of li as linear in science. They're all actually nonlinear. They can all be taken up to a place where whatever their predictability seem to be to our common sense 
uh, suddenly goes awry. We're much, much better. And if you think of these exponential curves, the most important thing to think about them is to take the place where they are getting started and look at it in our time scales and realize, oh, that looks exactly like it's linear. It took Charles Keeling, a name everybody should know here because he was the first real scientist who did the first real measurements that gave us global war uh, warming as a problem uh, all the way back in the late 50s. So we've actually, we've actually had the, uh, we've actually had a warning from enough data collected to see that the curve that he was measuring in carbon dioxide buildup uh, was not uh, either uh, flat or linear, but was actually an exponential. And so we had adequate warning to start dealing with the global warming problem as early as 1963. And there are many, many things that could have been done if most people's imaginations were informed by science to be able to understand his results. They weren't, they still aren't today. And you can tell because even though people are talking about global warming, they're talking about it in an absolutely ridiculous way. Now is way too late for any kind of market solutions when there are big countries that can buy carbon credits up the gazoo. Forget about it. The climate can be easily toppled uh, be before people run out of money. We have to take Einstein seriously. And the reason I'm here, I think, is because I was lucky enough to be a participant in one of these enormous revolutions, uh, the one that brought you personal computing and the internet. Uh, I was part of the community. I was a group leader at Xerox PARC. I invented the graphical user interface that you use. I had a lot to do with tablet computers and networking and so forth. And that was part of a community which was very similar to, for instance, the community here in the United States that developed radar, which was the prime technology that won the war for the Allies rather than for the enemy. People uh, think... Just sorry, yeah. but those, so those examples that you're pulling out um, and Xerox Park, you would say that is an example of the Einstein quote in action. Yes. It was a new level of thinking that solved... Yes, and all of these. So in this document, I picked... A simple one like the Empire State Building, which went up in about a year, starting, starting from demolition and planning to occupancy. That which was at the time was impossible. absurd, impossible. I think the Chinese are doing it now, but uh, uh, I picked Radar, I picked Bletchley Park. That's another one where people were so worried about uh, the Germans that they finally said, where are the boffins? Where are the people who actually know something about the physical universe? We need to finally pay attention to them. And they did, and they did it in an exemplary fashion on both sides of the Atlantic. That was a huge factor also in uh, winning that war. Um, I picked the Manhattan Project just as an example of something really big that can be done really quickly. Can you explain the man, what the Manhattan Project is? Manhattan Project was the atomic bomb project. I'll commend this book, which is in the references of this thing. This is a book by the guy who headed it, Major General Groves. It's called Now It Can Be Told. And it's a very matter-of-fact book because the guy was an engineer. It's not a popular book. <laughs> but in fact, it just matter-of-factly says, well, he realized it wasn't about... The, the, the scientists knew what was needed, and what was needed was fissionable material, and nobody knew how to do it. And so at the end of this thing, he had about 700,000 people. He had set up whole new towns, including bringing in doctors and school teachers, and uh, he mobilized uh, uh, 100, basically 1% of all of the money the US spent in the war was spent on this project to just get it done, and they violated most principles of what business people think are prudent ways of doing things. But the violations were the things that allowed them to be successful. 
And so this, so the second thing I'd like you to take away is, yeah, when you have something big to do, uh, besides the fact that it's nonlinear and you need to do something different, you don't want to abandon rational ways of doing things. You just don't want to let the rational ways of doing things get in the way of things that seem crazy. Because the most important thing to understand is pretty much everything we do with the physical world today would be a burnt at the stake offense 500 years ago. What changed was the context. Newton was one of the big factors in changing that context. And all of a sudden, in the new context, you could think thoughts that were literally crazy, uh, according to the, and So this is the thing to realize, that whenever you think you're thinking reasonably about something that is really difficult, beware. So having heuristics set up to say, how, how are we actually allocating our intellectual capital here? How much of it, this are we trying to do with top-down planning? How much of it are we actually trying to do by getting uh, highly talented, crazy people to try and think up new things that are not in our top-down ways of doing things? And how much problem-solving are we doing versus how much problem-finding are we doing? So I just want to jump in there because I feel like, you're, you know, you do, in your essay you do lay out a few examples of projects that you think are, have demonstrated this uh, just a level up in thinking, to an, I, yes, I the, but as you also in, as in si one way to think of it is there are a lot of different sciences, and the knowledge that the different sciences find is rather specific to the sciences. But the methods mm -hmm. in science are much more uniform across because they have to do with how do you go looking at for things, how do you uh, judge what you're doing, uh, how do you get new ideas, how do you ha be open at the first level, so you, because otherwise you'd be dogmatic if you didn't admit every crazy idea in science. But if you're going to have every crazy idea there, you can, you have to do what most democracies don't do, which is to go have a next level, which is the best criticism that anybody has ever invented. Science works because it's a two-level system. Most government systems don't work because they try and have something that is like a religion that is generally agreed on. And you really want to be crazy at one level and very, very sane at the next level. And can I, can we come back then to some of those examples? Because, you know, when you were talking about crazy projects, so it'd be, be up for crazy projects. Employ great people, the truly great people, and give them freedom. Don't try and organize top down. What are some of those, can you expand on some of those well, characteristics? It's, it, it's again, it's one of those things where I wish it were more simple. Be, and it's not that there aren't heroes. There are. But the hero's journey is a trope that misleads most people who don't fool around with this stuff. It's not really about people in garages. So, but however, there are heroes. And it's not about small groups, but there are small groups. But if you look at the huge jumps not just in simple scaling, but in context, and science is a good example itself, it works because it is a community where the community passes ideas around freely. It doesn't know who's going to do the next good thing, and it relies on the community to help keep things that are used for new things uh, to be vetted rather carefully. So you have this mixture of things which is really hard. It doesn't wrap into a religion and it doesn't wrap into the way most co companies are organized. So it's very difficult. Uh, it frightens most uh, C-level executives and it frightened the executives of Xerox, I can tell you, uh, when they came out to Palo Alto to see how we were doing what we were doing. They thought we were out of control um, we weren't out of control any more than the internet is out of control. The internet has, has grown to 50 billion nodes now without any central control, but it has control. It's a different kind of control. In order to get the internet, we had to abandon the kind of thinking that went into switched 
telephone systems and hub control and star networks and all of those things. You had to abandon and go to something more like a biological model. And that looked out of control to most people who had wedded their life to a particular way of doing things. So the number one thing here is when somebody talks about scaling, it's, it's not the number. It's when does the scaling become different? And when are you going to notice that the scaling has become different? That's the big deal, and that is what you need heuristics for when you're trying to take something that works in the small and try and employ it in the large. For instance, almost any particular effort in saving the planet from pollution or global warming or all of these things really has to be done in the context that all of these systems are actually rather tied to each other, and we don't know what all of those systems are. The climate simulations that have been done have all been in the direction of measurement following behind the simulations, but in almost every case, the actual global warming that's been going on has been, been worse than the simulations predicted. That means that the simulations aren't capturing some gotchas uh, that could be really terrifying in another 20 years. To go from really terrifying gotchas to maybe examples of some communities that give you hope today, if there are any, and in our, <laughs> in our preparation, I'm just going to... Let's see, you're saying this in the context of you being from the UK <laughs> with what's going on here and me being from the US with what's going on there. Yeah, but so, okay, in the US, you mentioned uh, the Janelia Labs. Is that, yeah, Janelia... Uh, 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 but that is a current... Yes, Janelia is a current lab. Uh, it's funded in part by the Hughes uh, Foundation. They did a very good thing. One of the spark plugs is a guy, one of my favorite guys. I used to be a molecular biologist in my misspent youth, and uh, one of my heroes was Sidney Brenner. Just died recently, a Nobel Prize winner from South Africa, but uh, he was fundamental to DNA here in Cambridge, and he was one of the spark plugs to get things started in many places in the world, and Janelia Labs near Washington, D.C. is one of them. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty impressive... And can you just, maybe, just thinking about some of those characteristics, what, what, is, it, what is it about Janelia Labs that you like? Well, I think the... Uh, I wrote down 19 of them in, the, in this document. Um, I think the, num the number one thing is, as... The immensity of the difficulties starts impinging on us. We have to go away from funders trying to pick goals. It's natural, it's their money, they're responsible. But all the good funders in history let the people who are going to do the work pick the goals. What the funders did was to put together a vision, which is not the same as a goal, and it's not the same as a mission. A vision is a picture of a future state of things which is, uh, would be really nice if we had. So, for instance, the one that I worked under, the sentence was, the destiny of computers are to become inter interactive intellectual amplifiers for all humans on Earth pervasively networked worldwide. And the guy who set up this funding and the community that did it would not peel it down to a hard goal. He said, no, no, we'll get everybody who thinks they can do something against this vision. We'll fund them. And uh, if, we're, if we get, given what we're funding and the level of aspiration we have, if we get 30% success, we'll change the world qualitatively. Uh, the result of that funding... Uh, did have about uh, maybe 40% success, but it's almost every technology that you use today in computing. And uh, the return on the investment just from Xerox Park. so Xerox Park is maybe, I don't know, $120 million. The return on investment from Xerox Park has been about $40 trillion. So this flabbergast, business people think they're in business to make money, but they aren't. 
They're just trying to make a few bucks safely. The way you make money is take advantage of the deep knowledge we have about the universe and what can actually be done with it by uh, people who are not to, trying to do too much planning ahead of time. And so in, in that, so you're talking about funding and, the, and that being that kind of unrestrictedness, you know, having the vision to aim for and having less restrictions tied to money. Yeah. It feels uh, like there is a serendipity. Well, the, the other MacArthur Foundation in the U.S. <laughs> Let's talk about the other MacArthur Foundation. Yeah. It's confusing this enough is, as it is. This is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And I, now that I live over here, I think of the one in the U.S. as the other MacArthur Good. Yeah, that's Foundation. Right. I think that's but, what they do is uh, pick, I don't know, 20 people, 30 people a year that they th think show promise, and they give them a five-year, no-strings-attached grant of $625,000, period. They don't worry that people can go off and do nothing. However, it happens that people that have art in their blood can't not do nothing. It's a calling. It's like being called to the ministry. or So you don't have to worry about the people who are going to make the thing here. They want to do this. The best thing that can ever happen to them is for somebody to fund them to follow their instincts. And yeah, 70% of them are going to be not going to play out. But like in baseball and some other sports, those errors are not errors but overhead. It's really important to think of when you're funding edge-of-the-art research that the things that don't work out are not failure. They're just overhead for trying to do something really difficult. And if you're aiming high enough, the successes you get, like Xerox, Xerox, the company, made a return on investment themselves just on the laser printer that we invented there of about a factor of 250 paid for park hundreds of times over. And the world made a return on investment much, much larger than, than that. So the, this is kind of the inverse black swan idea. Right? Black swan, you don't worry about how rare it is. What you worry about is how big the disaster is going to be when you get it. The inverse black swan, the whites, the super whites or the gold swan. The gold swan is don't worry about stuff that doesn't work out. If worry about what the percentage that needs to work out that will pay for everything else a hundred times over and goose the human race into a next level of thinking. Well, I can't think of a, a better way to finish our talk because we're a couple of minutes over time. Yes, it's on, blinking at us. It's, bl it's been blinking, yeah. On the idea of I more, more, of those. <laughs> more gold swans. That's what we need. Yeah, well, it's when I... Just to finish out, when I uh, had my group at Disney for five years, uh, really interesting five years it was, I gave a presentation to the Disney uh, executives on all the new ways to kill the goose that was trying to lay the golden eggs that have been invented since the fairy tale. Like, make the goose a manager, give the goose a deadline, uh, want co gold coins instead of eggs, want platinum eggs instead of gold. And I said, no, you guys are just completely missing the point here. If you've got geese that lay golden eggs, you can convert them into coins. You can convert them into platinum. Let the frigging geese lay the frigging eggs. <laughs> thank you. Alan. Thank you very much. I can honestly say it has been a huge privilege just working with you on this for the last few weeks. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe and Alan. I feel like there's a whole load of more exciting things in that bag of tricks, but maybe we'll uh, find out what in the next Well, I had a feeling break. that nobody would read the thing, so I, I even made a few slides up. But uh, I decided to just, since they didn't have slides 100,000 years ago, I decided to just go with 100,000 years ago. You're kicking it old school. Ago. I like it. By the way, one thing here for people. Uh, we're in a roundhouse. And many of you are probably not engineers, but some might be. You may not be aware, but almost every roundhouse, especially in the UK, right, the trains are on this thing. and yeah. Those trains 
Those locomotives were swiveled by usually one person with no engines. They were just, those turntables that the engines were on were some of the most beautifully engineered things done in the 19th century. And it's a kind of a small as beautiful thought to end this session with. You Thank you, Alan. You don't need the transistors so much. You don't need the gas engines so much. You just need really good designers. Really good design and engineering.